who watch us uh, on YouTube can join us as well. And of course, it provides, uh, it captures a nice, uh, a nice record for us, for those who couldn't make it uh, tonight. And this is such a uh, such an important and interesting topic that I know that many of us will want to continue um, and and come back to it, uh, perhaps to some of the things that we'll hear tonight, but also to share it with those who can't make it tonight. Um, come on, YouTube, show it. There we go. Excellent. So everything everything is now up and running, which means that we can continue. We will begin with Havdalah. Uh, it is the end of Shabbat. So Olga, would you please light the candle? Uh, and share it with us. Oh, how beautiful is that? La Yehudi Hai Taora Hai Taora Vesimcha Vesason Vika La Yehudi Hai Taora Hai Taora Vesimcha vesasom vikam. Ken tiye lanu, tiye lanu, tiye I see Marilyn has her candle, and I see that Lee has hers. How beautiful is that? What a gorgeous amount of light. <laughs> Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Borei Priagafen Borei Priagafen Yananai Nai Nananai Yananai Nai Yananai Nai Yananai Nai Yananai Yananai Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Borei minei besamim Borei minei besamim Smell something spicy Yananai nai yananai Yananai nai yananai nai Yananai nai yananai Yananai Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Bore meore haesh Bore meore haesh Yananai nai yananai Yananai nai yananai nai Yananai nai yananai Yananai Eloheinu melech haolam Mavdil bein kodesh lechol Bein or lechoshek Bein Israel la'amin Bein yom ha'shevi Lesheshet lamei ha'mase Lesheshet yamei ha'mase Baruch ata Adonai, 
המבדיל בין קודש לחול, המבדיל בין קודש לחול. אוקיי, אם אתה יכול להנמיט את Shavua Tov, everyone. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. What a gorgeous way to end Shabbat. And um, an even more exciting opportunity coming up for us right now. I just need to make sure that I have given Dr. Kant Harris um, a co-host um, ability so that he can, uh, he'll be able to share uh, his presentation with us. This is a, um, a very brief introduction because I really uh, don't want to spend too much time, take away too much time from, uh, from the actual conversation. Dr. Keith Kant Harris is a sociologist and a writer. He's a senior lecturer at Leo Beck College, my alma mater, and he runs the European Jewish Research Archive at the Institute for Jewish Policy Research. Uh, his sixth book, uh, Strange Hate, Antisemitism, Racism, and the Limits of Diversity, was published last June. Uh, in fact, this, uh, this program was a number of months in the making. Uh, Dr. Khan Harris was going to come and be with us last January. Unfortunately, um, life gets in the way sometimes. And so we were not able to, um, uh, to come together and enjoy this conversation all the way back. But now that we have restarted uh, or started reconnecting to programming, now that High Holidays are out of the way, um, I reached out to, uh, to Keith and asked if he was willing to come back. And so, first of all, uh, Keith, thank you so much for staying up that late. I don't know whether 10 o'clock is oh, late or not. <laughs> But we we appreciate the time difference, and uh, and I must say that with all the negative things about uh, the reality of Zoom, this one makes traveling a little easier, right? You don't have to leave your family Absolutely. behind and, and and come and join. So with without uh, without further ado, um, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Keith Kahn Harris. Thanks so much, Michael, for invi uh, inviting me. It would have been great to have seen you in the flesh all of you earlier this year, but as, as Michael says, life sometimes gets in the way. It's funny actually, because um, I've done quite a few Zoom lectures, seminars and stuff and, and things like that since uh, the pandemic hit in, in, in March. But they mostly, when I think about it, they've mostly been uh, with people who live close to me, <laughs> which is, well, this is the first time I've done a talk uh, across the oceans, so to speak. So uh, we should, it's the sort of thing we should be doing more of, I think. So I'm very pleased to do it. I have a PowerPoint, which I am going to share. Uh, I'm going to speak for 30, 40 minutes. So hopefully there'll be time for questions. Um, okay, so I just need to share my screen. Can you see that? Nod your head. I can see some of you. Can you see the PowerPoint? Fantastic. Um, so Michael very helpfully held up a copy of my book. It actually came out last year rather than this year. It's called Strange Hate, Anti-Semitism, Racism and the Limits of Diversity. Fear not, while I will be talking about the arguments in the book, I will also be drawing on material that isn't in the book. Uh, this isn't just a sales pitch. Uh, partly because the world has moved on a little bit in certain respects since when I wrote the book. Um, so where did this book come from? Well, I've been researching, writing and thinking about Jews for a long time. Um, 
these are some of the things that I've done, mostly about British Jewry, although not exclusively. And that's one of my major research interests as a sociologist is Jews, the sort of world, the sort of communities, the sort of culture that Jews build. And my previous book, uh, in 2014, I published a book called Uncivil War, the Israel conflict in the Jewish community, which was about how and why Jews disagree on Israel and the sort of conflicts that, that occur between Jews. And uh, uh, Kith, uh, I just wanted to uh, to ask, is there a way that you can start presenting on your screen Would that? Because I think it will probably make those slides larger for everyone to see. Uh, meaning it just if you hit on slideshow at the top. Uh, okay. You'll have to let me know whether that works. Yeah. Good. Uh, uh, hmm. Interesting. No, I can change. Not uh, quite. Are you showing the, am I see? Are you seeing the presenter view rather? Yes, than, yes, we are. We ended up right. Uh, okay. So what I can do is share a different screen, which would be that one. <laughs> that work better? Yes. Perfect. Fine. Excellent. Thank you so much. So I was very interested. I've been very interested in why Jews disagree and the conflicts between Jews. I have to say that anti-Semitism was never a major interest of mine, or at least not a professional interest in my, uh, of mine. Uh, obviously, it was part of understanding what it means to be a Jew. Certainly, as a, as a, as a member of Jewish communities myself, as a Jew, anti-Semitism was always something that concerned me. So don't get me wrong. I was interested in anti-Semitism to that degree. But I always felt like, well, I'd always been taught that anti-Semitism wasn't about Jews. Anti-Semitism was about anti-Semites. And I think that has often been the, been the case, and it is still the case to an extent. But I think these days, part of my point is that anti-Semitism has become more about Jews than it used to be. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today, how Jews have become part of debates and controversies over what anti-Semitism is and how Jews have been used by non-Jews who have been accused of anti-Semitism, sometimes as a kind of alibi. Now, one of, the, one of the, my starting points here is that Jews are often inconvenient. What do I mean by inconvenient? Well, there are always Jews that are not what you would actually like them to be. There are always Jews who don't fit the stereotype in maybe an inconvenient sort of way. And also there are always anti-Semitisms that are per perpetrated by those on your side. And that's inconvenient too because it can be embarrassing, it can be awkward, it can complicate certain narratives. But there is a way out. There is a way of dealing with the inconvenience of certain kinds of Jews. There is a way of uh, dealing with the anti-Semitism that is perpetrated by those on your side. There is a way out. It's just not a very good way out. And that is what my book crit, uh, criticizes. One thing that has been become dramatically apparent, I think, in the last uh, few years, few decades, has been what I call the discovery of Jewish diversity. Now, Jews always knew that Jews are diverse. You know the old uh, saying, two Jews, three opinions. So Jews always knew that. And we also knew that we're diverse religiously. We're diverse in terms of uh, ethnic origin. We can be Sephardi or Ashkenazi or Mizrahi or, uh, 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 and so on. It's not that non-Jews didn't know that to a degree. It's just that the, the, the ability, uh, the, the, the discovery of Jewish diversity has started to become very, very convenient for certain kinds of non-Jews. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about 
events in Britain. I'm also going to talk about events in America. But my book was very much written uh, out of and as a response to a long running controversy over anti Semitism in Britain uh, as, uh, in the Labour Party, which is the, the, the major left wing party in this country. I presume you've all heard of Jeremy Corbyn. Have you all heard of Jeremy Corbyn? The, he was, Jeremy Corbyn was the uh, leader of the British Labour Party until earlier this year. He was elected as leader in 2015. He was from the far left and almost from the very beginning of his reign as leader in the British Labour Party. He was dogged by accusations of that anti-Semitism had increased in the party to a very, very significant extent and that he himself uh, was at best ignorant of, of anti-Semitism when it came from people on his side that he was sympathetic to, such as from certain elements in, 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 in Palestinian solidarity movements, and that at worst, he himself was implicated in anti-Semitic events. I'm not going to delve too deeply into that. What I want to do is to draw to your attention that very frequently, this controversy over anti-Semitism Labour Party involved competing sets of Jews. One of the moments of this was in uh, a demonstration outside of Labour's National Executive Committee, which is uh, basically its governing committee, essentially. It's elected from within the party in September 2018, because during that committee meeting, the party was due to make a uh, uh, a, uh, a deliberation over the definition of anti-Semitism they would use. And there were two sorts of demonstrations here. And in both, Jews were at the forefront. One of them, as you can see on top, was, was from Jewish protesters, uh, many of them wielding Israeli flags, who were urging the Labour Party, who were demonstrating against anti-Semitism in the party, and arguing that the, uh, the, the, um, the party should adopt what's called the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism. I won't go into details about what that actually is. Across the street was a counter demonstration, which was from uh, various uh, far left groups, including Palestinian solidarity campaigners. And at the very front, were two sets of Jewish groups. One was from the Ture Kata, which is the uh, Haredi anti-Zionist group. And the other was from a group called Jewish Voice for Labour, which was, uh, it, which is made up with so, uh, socialist, non-Zionist and anti-Zionist Jews. And they were arguing that the party should not adopt this definition of anti-Semitism. So it was very much Jew versus Jew. Indeed, much of the dynamic of the conflict within the Labour Party about anti-Semitism was to do with uh, a conflict between two Jewish groups within the party. One was the Jewish Labour Movement, which upholds the tradition of socialist Zionism. It's an affiliated society. The Labour Party has been for nearly 100 years. And they were fighting, saying that anti-Semitism is a serious problem in the, in the party. And then there was Jewish Voice for Labour, which upholds the uh, non-Zionist or anti-Zionist socialist uh, tradition who are saying that anti-Semitism is not a party to that extent and Jeremy Corbyn personally is not uh, implicated in it. So this Jew versus Jew controversy over what anti-Semitism is, isn't just something that's on the left and it isn't just something that's in the UK. I don't want to talk too much about Donald Trump here uh, 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 at the moment, but I was very struck by a speech that Donald Trump made uh, nearly a year ago to the Israeli American Council, which said a number of things. One of them, he said, we have to get the people of our country to love Israel more. We have to get them to love Israel more because you have people that are Jewish, that are Jewish people, that are great people, they don't love Israel enough. So this was a, a sort of sense of saying, uh, that the Jews who don't love Israel enough may be great people, but they're not being Jewish properly. In the same speech, Donald Trump also said, and I think he thought this was a compliment, a lot of you are in the real estate business, 
you're brutal killers, not nice people at all. He also said, even if you don't like me, you're going to be my biggest supporters because you'll be out of business in about 15 minutes. So basically, he was accused from this, from multiple Jewish sources, of uh, drawing on tropes about Jewish wealth and power that have anti-Semitic resonances, that it was inappropriate uh, for Donald Trump to make, to say that some sorts of Jews aren't being properly Jewish enough. So there was a lot of criticism from that side, and not just within, you know, uh, Jews within the Democrat Party. And on the other hand, you also had reactions saying the opposite. So for the Israeli, the Israeli, um, for, for the organisation that uh, invited him, said, said, gave him uh, essentially a glowing reference for what he said. It was a momentous day for our organisation, the Israeli American community. Other people said Jewish groups would be wrong. Trump discusses the Democrats' threat to the current economic boom. So you had different kinds of Jews accusing Donald Trump of flirting with anti-Semitism and other kinds of Jews saying, no, that's not anti-Semitic. And this is one of the things that makes these debates so difficult, conflictual and often unpleasant. And that leads me to say that a lot of the problem with anti-Semitism today is actually philo-Semitism. The heart of the problem is philo-Semitism. In other words, a certain kind of love for the Jews is causing Jews a great deal of problems. The British Labour Party, one thing that Jeremy Corbyn talked a lot about was something called the Battle of Cable Street. This was in uh, 1936, where uh, Jews, uh, uh, in the East End, which was it was a bit like uh, the, the Lower East Side in London. East, uh, the, it was the East End of London, heavily Jewish area. There was uh, a fascist group led by someone called Oswald Mosley who was going to march through this Jewish area. And Jewish groups and trade unionists and socialists united to uh, fight the police who were guarding uh, Oswald Mosley, and in the end, the march didn't manage to succeed because these people fought back against that. And that is a sort of defining moment uh, within British Jewry and also on the left in Britain. And Jeremy Corbyn constantly talks about it. In particular, he talks about the fact that his mother was at the Battle of Cable Street. And this is indicative that Jeremy Corbyn was someone who actually did have a very strong identification with Jews a very strong identification with a particular kind of Jewish tradition, the tradition uh, of Jewish, largely secular, often not Zionist anti-fascism. So I would say that Jeremy Corbyn was an anti-Semite. And this is also the case on the right in America and elsewhere. You have someone like Pastor John Hagee of, uh, uh, I think the organization is called Christians United for Israel, who has been accused of, of, of saying, uh, of theologically not having the best interests of Jews at heart, but he is unquestionably a philo He sees uh, the state of it, uh, he sees a certain kind of Zionist Jew as the embodiment of what Jews are and should be. And it is that kind of Jew that he identifies with. And it's that kind of Jew that allows him to reject other kinds of Jews. There's often st a strong sense of entitlement here from non-Jews to speak of who Jews are and who, more importantly, who Jews should be. And this is part of this exposure to Jewish diversity. The fact that there are multiple kinds of Jews available basically allows non-Jews to say, well, why can't you all be like my favorite kind of Jew? So here's an example of that. Um, this is Rudy Giuliani, uh, from Rudy Giuliani. You sometimes see a kind of what I call a philo-Semitism without Jews, an identification and love for particular kind of Jews that is so strong that it almost doesn't need Jews at all. <laughs> so Giuliani made a, a speech a while back about George Soros. Now, George tropes about George Soros are often... I think rightly, in my opinion, seen as anti-Semitic tropes in the same way 
that, uh, that, that anti-Semitism often focuses on the Rothschild family. Um, Giuliani, uh, this was a year or two ago, pushed back very strongly against that. Don't tell me I'm anti-Semitic if I oppose him. Soros is hardly a Jew. I'm more of a Jew than Soros is. I'm probably more about, he doesn't go to church, he doesn't go to religion, synagogue, he doesn't belong to a synagogue, he doesn't support Israel, he's an enemy of Israel. He's elected eight anarchist DAs in the United States, he's a horrible human being. So this is basically a non-Jewish person saying, I know what it is to be a Jew. And that sense of entitlement is wrapped up in a certain kind of anti-Semitism too and provides a license for anti-Semitism. So how do we understand this? Well, I'm going to draw on a, a concept here by, I don't know if people have heard of Zygmunt Bauman. He died two or three years ago. He was uh, originally Polish, uh, but lived in, uh, but left Poland in 1968 to go first to Israel, then to Britain. And he was a very distinguished sociologist. And he coined the term allosemitism, which, which never really took off, but I think it's a brilliant term. And he says, allosemitism refers to the practice of setting Jews apart as people radically different from all the others, needing separate concepts to describe and comprehend them and special treatment in all or most social intercourse. It does not ambiguously determine either hatred or love of Jews, but contains the seeds of both and assures that whichever of the two appears is intense and extreme. So this, I think, describes quite nicely how love and hatred of Jews can often be bound up together. Now, I don't use the term allosemitism, although I think it is a very useful one. I've come up with my own vocabulary to talk about this phenomena. And that is a distinction that I draw between what I call consensus anti-Semitism and selective anti-stroke Semitism. When I first, when I wrote this in my book, my mum said, you've misspelled anti-Semitism many, many times in this book. You put a, you put a, a, dash, a, a stroke in the, in the middle, it doesn't work. No, I said, no, it was absolutely deliberate because what I wanted to show was that it was anti-Semitism, but also pro-Semitism. Anyway, what's consensus anti-Semitism? And what is selective anti-Semitism? Consensus anti-Semitism is hate, hate for Jews. Selective anti-Semitism is love for certain kinds of Jews and hate for others. Consensus anti-Semitism assumes all Jews are the same. Selective anti-Semitism recognizes to some degree at least that Jews are diverse. Consensus anti-Semitism is targeted at all Jews. So when the killer burst into the Tree of Life synagogue in Pittsburgh, I think that was two or maybe three years ago, I don't remember exactly, he said all Jews must die. That was consensus anti-Semitism. Selective anti-Semitism targets some Jews for love and some Jews for hate. Consensus anti-Semitism is uninterested in who Jews actually are. Selective anti-Semitism is knowledgeable, at least to a degree, about Jews. But here's what's really important. Consensus anti-Semitism is recognized nearly universally by Jews as anti-Semitism. No, no Jew disagrees that the Nazis were anti-Semitic. But selective anti-Semitism causes enormous conflicts between Jews over what is anti-Semitism. It stokes into intra-Jewish communal tension. And in some cases, to a degree, it even tears Jewish communities apart. And that is part of the harm it does. Now, there's a wider context to this. This isn't just a phenomena that we find with regard to Jews. I argue that we're seeing a wider emergence of selective anti-racism. An anti-racism and a racism that go hand in hand. And I think there are two, two types. The first type selects some minorities over, over, my, over other minorities. So you might see Jews as worthy of protecting against racism, but non-Muslims or, or, or African-Americans. Type two selects sections of minorities over other sections, which is what we just talked about here. It's not just the case with Jews sees certain members of minorities as worthy of anti-racist protections, but not others. 
to type one selective anti-racism where you select some uh, minorities over others, you saw very much in, for example, uh, the protest at what was erroneously seen to be a mosque, the pro proposal to build a mosque at Ground Zero. It wasn't actually, it wasn't actually at Ground Zero. It was a few blocks away and it wasn't actually a mo mosque. It was an Islamic cultural center. And one thing that was very striking is that some of the protesters against that uh, did so under Israeli flags when they weren't Jews. It was very much a statement saying, by supporting Jews, or at least by supporting Israel, our idea of what Jews should be, we are striking a blow against Islam. Type two selective anti-racism chooses the good minority members over the bad ones. And according to where you are in the political spectrum, you'll, you will probably select certain people. So on the left is Ayan Hersiali. Her, her, her uh, uh, she is a, a woman of Somali origin who describes herself as an ex-Muslim and is personally very brave in breaking away from, from the, 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 the background that she brought up. But her argument is basically that Islam is essentially more or less unredeemable. And that's a very nice message for certain kinds of people. And she becomes, certainly on sections of the, of the right, the good Muslim. On the right is Ilan, o Ilan Omar, who is very much the good Muslim for a lot of people on the left, for her uh, particular political commitments. And people pick and choose who are the good Muslims, who are the bad Muslims, just as they pick who are the good Jews and the bad Jews. Why is this happening? I argue part of the reason for this is due to what I call the unspeakability of racism and anti-Semitism. It's very difficult to come out openly with racist and anti-Semitic discourse. It needs an alibi. We are not living in a world at the moment where it's easy to say these things openly, although it's probably getting easier than it once was. So therefore it's really important to find those members of minorities who can indemnify you against charges of racism and or anti-Semitism. But another reason I think is to do with the internet and social media, which I think tells us more than we ever knew before about minorities. And particularly it tells us more than we ever knew about minorities within minorities, because everybody today has a voice. So marginal groups within the Jewish or the Muslim community can take out an, out, uh, an importance way beyond their size because Twitter or something is a level playing field. It also increases the desire and the ability to speak out. It's very hard for any community, the Jewish community or whatever, to marginalize certain kinds of people. And because everybody has a voice, it makes it much easier for people to pick and choose the members of those minorities that they like or dislike. What selective anti-racism does is to square the circle. It allows hatred to be expressed while preserving anti-racist credentials. It allows people across the political spectrum to be anti-racists as well as to be racist. I am gonna skip the next slide. So why is this a bad thing? One of the reasons is it intensifies intra-group conflict. It intensifies uh, conflict between Jews. Certainly that was my experience in Britain where Jeremy Corbyn's uh, Labour Party became a source of intense confrontation between different kinds of Jews. And it certainly made the Jewish community a much more difficult place to be in, in certain respects, irrespective of the anti-Semitism coming from in the party. But more deeply, it makes anti-racism conditional. Somehow, and I think this is a particular problem on the left, anti-racism has become almost like re a reward for good behavior. Basically, if you're the sort of minority or part of a minority we like, then we will protect you. But that isn't what anti-racism is supposed to be. It also makes diversity unbearable because it turns diverse societies into comp competing voices uh, who clamor for to legitimize other people, uh, other minorities. 
and it weakens collective action, action against racism. It makes forming coalitions against racism extremely difficult. Paradoxically, I argue that some of the reasons why this is developed is because of a problem with love. This is a tweet from Jeremy Corbyn from a couple of uh, uh, 2019. I don't like the word tolerance. I don't tolerate somebody. I respect somebody. I work with somebody. I love somebody. I don't like the idea I've got to tolerate them because they're a different faith. No respect is a much better way. This was the heart of the problem in the Labour Party. Because the fact is, is that not everybody can be lovable. Jeremy Corbyn couldn't understand certain kinds of Jews. And because he saw love as the predominant way one should relate to minorities, he did not know what to do with those Jews to whom he could not relate. Love as the gold standard of anti-racism is in my view a major problem because it sets the bar way too high. Anti-racism shouldn't be a reward for being lovable. It should be unconditional. So I suggest that we need to rethink anti-racism. In some ways that I'm aware this is paradoxical and not very good theologically from a Jewish perspective. In some ways, principled indifference might be a sturdier basis for anti-racism than love. By saying, it doesn't matter to me what Jews do, what political commitments they might have, I will still protect them from abuse. That kind of indifference can actually be quite a powerful thing. The other thing is to accept the fact of what I call ethno-religious political identities. One of the major problems that you have on the left is a great difficulty of accepting that Jews are predominantly Zionist. And you often find, particularly on Twitter, people saying Judaism is a religion, Zionism is politics, the two are different things. But for most Jews, they're connected, they're intrinsically connected, rightly or wrongly. They're a fact, in the same way that in Muslim communities, there are also certain kinds of Muslim commi uh, uh, political commitments, and they are a fact. And we cannot let anti-racism be dropped simply because the politics of a particular minority is difficult uh, to accept. I argue for what I call sullen solidarity as being the most powerful solidarity. Solidarity is not, again, not being a reward for good behavior, but as something that is unconditional. And even if you don't like the people you are defending as being, I think there's something quite powerful in that. And I also argue for civility as a practice of restraint. Some, sometimes civility gets, uh, gets treated as, as niceness. I don't think civility is about niceness. I think civility is about restraining certain feelings and being careful in how you talk. It's not about being nice to people who, whose views you find intolerable. It's about accepting the fact that you have to live onside them and you cannot fall into racism. Finally, what should Jews do? How should Jews respond to selective anti-Semitism? My argument here is that we need to refuse love. We need to refuse to be the good Jew. Because love of Jews is all too often, not exclusively, I accept that, is all too often a love of certain kinds of Jews. And basically, when people say, say, I love the Jewish people, then the best response is to say, have you met those Jews at the end of the street? They're horrible. They're awful. You can't, you won't be able to stand them. Because ultimately, it's, it's about all of us or none of us. Being the good Jew is something that no Jew should want to be. And that, to me, seems to be the meaning of Jewish peoplehood, and it, me it means to me to be uh, the meaning of Klal Yisrael, is accepting the fact that our fates are tied up with the fate of Jews we don't like very much, and whose views we find abhorrent because we are all potentially victims of anti-Semitism. 
Okay. I went through a lot of stuff very quickly. Uh, I hope that made a degree of sense. Um, it made more okay. than a degree of sense. Uh, I was going to suggest that if people have questions, if you can kindly put them into a chat, you can send them into a chat to me uh, or to or to everyone, of course, and uh, uh, and Keith will see them as well. Uh, you're giving us uh, a lot of challenging food for thought. So, um, so do can I can I begin by asking you a question? Um, this is uh, since since so much of it plays out on the internal Jewish relationships. Um, how do we um, how does that impact how we navigate the internal Jewish arguments? Because the internal Jewish arguments can and do get pretty heated, right? They can be very practical or they can be very philosophical, um, but there are uh, you're, you're also Jewish, let's argue, right? So we do argue and we have we have that variety and we sometimes feel at very different ends of a spectrum. So how does that, um, that selective uh, anti-slash-Semitism uh, from outside, how do we navigate that plane onto the inter internal uh, process with, within us? I accept the fact that Jews argue. I mean, I argue. <laughs> you know, that's one of the things that we do. I mean, we can talk, it's a slight, there's a slightly separate issue, and I wrote a whole book about it in 2014 about how we argue and how we can argue better in ways that don't tear us apart. But in terms of the stuff I'm talking about tonight, I think the key thing to say is we shouldn't be using non Jews um, as, if you like, weapons to fight other Jews or as allies to fight other Jews. This was one of the things that was very, very striking in, uh, I don't want to go to, on too much about Britain, I don't want to be seen as parochial, but I think this was, if you'd read on anything that was going on about in Britain, this was one of the stories that you wouldn't have seen, is that in the British Labour Party, the Jew versus Jew battle was often intensely personal between people who had been arguing for decades. And what changed is once Corbyn had been elected is that these Jew on Jew battles were carried out on a bigger stage. They were very personal, but they'd been kept relatively contained because they were intra-Jewish battles. Now they became battles of national particular interest and people were using al allies who weren't Jewish as a way to bolster their fight against other Jews. And I see that as a real problem because I'm not suggesting that all battles belong. I'm not talking about that we should never talk about our issues in public. I, I, I certainly believe that sometimes there's a value in washing our dirty linen in public. But there's a difference between washing your dirty linen in public and washing your dirty linen in public with the help of other people, if you, see the, if you can see what the distinction is. So we have another question. Uh, we do. Um, Fran Grzynski is going to ask the next one. Hi. Um, I really liked your deconstruction of anti-Semitism. I, I thought um, it was quite provocative, but I also thought it was right on. So I would like to say that. I'm an ethicist, so I deal with a lot of the sort of the same issues from an ethical perspective rather than a sociological one per se. But I think we see we've seen that in our recent elections. We've seen it. Uh, you go to Israel, and the this this group of Jews hates that group of Jews, and and it just uh, then you get you get people who are espousing one group over another. Um, if you go back to the Nazis, they saw everybody as Jews, and they hated it. They hated the 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 whole thing. And I think your point about we can't let other people define who we are and and separate us in this fight against racism 
is very spot on and well taken. Well, thank you. I, I would add the caveat to that, that I'm not saying we shouldn't let, I, I, I'm not arguing for unity because I, I don't think, no. I don't think that's a practical proposition. Right. We are divided and we will stay divided. What I'm arguing about is managing those, how we yep. manage those divisions. And so, you know, as a basic rule of thumb, at least what I'd want to try and prevent is, is a situation where the experience of being Jewish is the experience of, of constantly being in a struggle, both with other Jews and yeah. with non-Jews. Because, I mean, to be glib about it, there's so much other good stuff. <laughs> You know, like the Havdalah before, you know, like that was nice. That was nice Jewish stuff, you know, and, and there's there's a lot of nice Jewish stuff. And whilst, OK, I, I, I appreciate the irony that I've written a book about not nice Jewish stuff. <laughs> I do think that not not uh, that nice Jewish stuff should be the priority. So I was just before I, I saw somebody put their hand up, but there was just a question in the the chat that I'm just gonna yeah yes there is and I'm actually asking um, um, Monty, Chris and Monty to ask that in, in person as well. well first of all I want to say that your definitions of anti-semitism are so subtle and interesting that it really I, I was really just I it's sort of blown away by the ideas of what of how you expressed I have not read the book yet and now I definitely want to read it, dive into it more. Um, but Monty had a question yeah, yeah, more. Yeah, my question is, um, historically, Jews have been so associated with labor. And yet, I don't fully understand um, Jeremy Corbyn as being labeled anti-Semite. I, 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 I don't know. I, I don't understand what's been publicized about that. Well, the mural and, and the, is one and the thing. Rea whether that's real or not. I, I don't know if people know about the mural with the Jewish banker stereotypes, but that was kind of upsetting to read about. Very upsetting. Well, the, I, yeah. the, the, there are various. There were various incidents uh, that were pointed to. Uh, most of them on their own could be seen as unfortunate, but not necessarily evidence of, of anything too major, but the, con the, the combination of them was the issue. The mural you're referring to, for those who don't know, was a mural in London's East End, uh, which appeared to show Jewish stereotypical bankers controlling the world. It was a bit more subtle than that, but, but not much. And he, um, it was shared on a Facebook po uh, post uh, because the local council were going to were going to scrub it off, and he def he defended it. He said he hadn't looked at it properly, but I think that was a lot of people at the time said that was the problem. He couldn't, you know, his carelessness about this. But actually, and a lot of people, I'm not the only person to say this. To some extent, the question of who is or who is not an anti-Semite isn't always a useful question. Uh, certainly within anti, a lot of anti-racist theory and practice, it's not about what is inside the individual's head. It's about what you do or what you say, how you behave, that is much more important. Because to some extent, what's inside Jeremy Corbyn's head or anybody else's head is, is, is kind of unknowable. So I would say that a lot of mainstream Jewish organizations, while they were bitterly critical of, of Corbyn's leadership in the Labour Party, most of them for, for a fairly long period, right up until the last few months of, of his leadership, didn't want to call him an anti-Semite. Because the, the other problem with the term anti-Semite is, it, it, is that it presumes someone is irredeemable. That is the core of your being. And sometimes that's true, um, but it, it, it can sometimes not be useful, even if it is true to point it out, because certainly when someone's a leader has administrative control over a political party, if you're saying that person is an anti-Semite, then you're basically saying 
there's no possibility of him doing anything or working with them. And, and certainly Jewish organizations did not want to take that step, I think rightly. But, but generally speaking, I, I, I prefer to speak about anti-Semitism or anti-Semitic tropes or anti-Semitic behavior more than I, uh, rather than talking about anti-Semites because it's, it's strategically, it, it, it's not necessarily always a good idea to use that because it, it basically cuts off any possibility of communication. Yeah. Um, the word occurs to me in the context of listening to you um, and, and, and what you're saying, um, political correctness, how does that fit into what you're talking about? We don't hear that term as much as we used to. <laughs> I'm old enough to remember, you know, I, I was old enough to remember when that term was born in the sort of mid to late 1980s. I've always had a problem with the term because it's sometimes used as a, a, as a way of dismissing any kind of attempt to develop, for example, anti-racist language. It's sometimes useful to, you know, it, it is true that sometimes those sorts of attempts to, to develop that language can become so much focused on language that they forget other structural ways that racism actually happens. And sometimes it can become trivial and nitpicking and annoying. Um, but there's a broader issue and the broader issue about language, which is, and I did allude to this in the talk, which is it wasn't just on the, the left that racism became anathema the language of racism became anathema way across the board, including to racists. If you look at the language, for example, of the far right, you do see old style, unabashed hate, use of the N-word and whatever. But you often see these days a very different kind of language. So you see often on the far right, they talk a lot about white genocide, right? So it's a way of appropriating the language of, of anti-racism to suit their own purposes or discrimination against whites uh, and so on. You will see, I actually, I, I mentioned this in my book. I, I saw a tweet a, a few years ago, which was a series of stickers on a, on a pickup truck, truck somewhere in, in American South. I didn't take it myself, someone sent it to me which said it had a Confederate flag, it had various racist slogans, and at the bottom it said, anti-racist. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and, and so I think that it, it may be superficial, it may be ridiculous, but we have to take seriously how there are problems with certain sorts of language becoming normative when the practices themselves are still still carry on, but in perhaps a slightly more devious way. Mm. I think there's generally also a term, and this really dates back to the 60s, is, is that the political, the liberal left became less and less interested in issues of, of class and social structure and become much more interested in issues of representation and language. Sometimes justifiably, there are some things that are not said anymore that should not be said, no question. But often, often the nuts and the nuts and bolts of structural racism tend to get a bit neglected. Yeah. One of the things, and you can see this tension in Black Lives Matter, because on the one hand, it's absolutely about structural racism. It's about what happens in police departments, how we should run them how we should fund them and all that. So it's absolutely on that. But there are also tendencies that are much more focused on things like language. And I think personally that they're much less useful often. Yeah. So let, let me just uh, pivot off of that. Um, if, you, if you can find the guy <laughs> wagging his head here. Okay, that's me. Um, and, you know, anti-Semitism has become, you know, an incendiary an incendiary that's used uh, for political reasons rather than substantive ones. 
Uh, on the left, you have Jews who claim uh, that uh, Jews are being anti-Semitic uh, and not following the scripture in embracing neighbors and being able to seek peace, but rather are paying attention to Zionism <clears throat> as you would racism. And on the right, you have people calling such Jews anti-Semites because they're not supporting um, a Jewish home and not supporting uh, the ways that we need to learn and live together. <clears throat> I'm more concerned about the polarization that we've seen everywhere in the Jewish community, in civil life, um, where the language itself becomes incendiary devices that divide and divide in ways that are almost irreconcilable. And so my question to you, having thought about and looked at this, is how in the 21st century do we even think about reconciliation or understanding when such incendiaries are universal? I, I, I don't want to say that everything is the internet's fault, <laughs> but I think it's often don't worry, I'm going to address it more directly, but I'm starting from here. <laughs> it's it, it certainly what it's done is that it's tipped over very, very difficult conflictual situations into the point of irre irreconcilability. So one example of that is since the 1970s, the feminist movement has been split down the middle over the question of what a woman is whether how much it's a biological or a, or, a, or a social category and so the issue of whether trans people can be thought trans women should be thought of women has always been a conflictual thing within feminism but the show up until relatively recently just about stayed on the road it's only relatively recently that it is it is tearing feminist communities apart to the point where they cannot put it back together again and that's social media, in my opinion, that's done that. That's been the, that little X factor. At the same time, I, I also, I, I have an instinct towards, towards depolarization and conflict resolution and, 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 and all that kind of good stuff. But I also have to recognize the, the, the pragmatic reality that some splits are so deep they cannot be easily solved. And some splits are so deep that they can only be... I, I, look, for example, what's happening in America right now, there is, there is a, a section of the American populace who will never, ever be able to reconcile themselves to the fact that uh, to a, a Biden presidency, not all Trump supporters by any, or voted for Trump, probably only a minority, but a significant minority will always see Biden as illegitimately elected, if indeed he is allowed to take office. I'm not sure. That is not the sort of thing that is that is easily uh, treatable by uh, simply toning down the language on one side or another. These are deep, significant splits. And it's probably only, it, it's gonna be very difficult to see how that is one, how that, how that is resolved without one side irrevocably winning or another. But all that said, all that said, it is possible to identify, to, 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 to recognize that it's probably only a minority of people who are irreconcilable on one side or another. So I do think depolarization, toning down the language, conflict resolution is possible, but we have to be aware of its limits, who it's possible with, who it's, possi who it's possible not. I don't think there is necessarily, it's possible necessarily to split the difference. There are political situations where the difference cannot be split. That's a very depressing thing, but all we, but the thing to do is to, is to reduce to the absolute minimum the number of people who cannot live with other people. 
that makes sense. I doubt, I feel slight I. I, I feel slightly uncomfortable with pontificating about the American elections here. Having said that, I have been reading American publications probably as much as anybody else here for the last three, well, five, last four or five years. So, and at least theoretically, you're still married to an, an American, right? I am married to it. I am married to. Well, an I, I think I think that there's a, there's a question as to how much Deborah can be still considered an a, an American. Well, she has she has dual citizenship. My that kids have dual citizenship. That is true. That was not a criticism. It was a, it was my attempt at humor. No, yeah. but there's there's you know actually <laughs> he's profoundly American here. But until she starts speaking, and then we all know. But there, she's very anglicized. Uh, but it but it just. To, as an addendum to that, to show how difficult this sort of stuff is, is Deborah does have a very large American family. Trump, some of them are Trump supporters. And this is where this is where these things become immensely painful. Mm-hmm. Right, because so conflict he... resolution, to some extent, has to start within those family groups, within friendship groups, within neighborhood groups. So Keith, again, just taking what you said based on your observations of what happens here in this country in America and anti-Semitism as it's been used as a bludgeon on both for the both the left and the right, taking that, then isn't that a powerful argument that, as you said, reconciliation is not going to happen, at least for a segment. And the real question then is if we accept the fact there will always be that deep division and mistrust then how do we go beyond that? It, if it's not reconciliation, and clearly, at least for part of us, it will not be, then what is it that will allow us to go on? Well, reconciliation, I would argue, is setting the bar way too high, at least at the moment. Reconciliation involves something profound, a profound coming together. Living just about alongside each other and with each other and not doing active harm to each other, I think that's a much more achievable goal. Reconciliation is possible between some. I'm not saying it's not possible, but we have to we have to be aware that that isn't necessarily going to pay in Peoria for most people. You know, do you like that phrase? I love that phrase. That's an American phrase I use all the time. Does it play in Peoria? I love it. Partly because Deborah's family is from Tulsa and there's a Peoria Avenue there. Uh, that's another subject. But in, in all seriousness, I think it's within everybody's capability to live on side friends and neighbours and within families without killing each other. I think that is possible. I think it's possible to, to take them into account, to accept the fact that they exist. Um, reconciliation is, is, is for those who are truly committed, I think. So do you think, um, you've brought up a lot of stuff for me. Do you think that in order to have reconciliation, you have to recognize a commonality or something that you have in common with the other person in, so that you can sort of have a, it could be a very low base, but a base from which to start. The thing that, that, that strikes me is you know often when we talk about um, societies and groups and we talk about who's in and who's out and who's the other, it seems to me that, that a lot of hatred is is focused towards the other, somebody who's not like us. But this has we've internalized the other into our groups so that it seems like it's been skewed so. Our, our differences, even though there is a broad base of commonality, we've started to recognize the other has become part of this intrinsic group of, of Jews. So it's no longer somebody outside our group, but it's actually somebody inside our group. And in focusing on that, we have sort of let the commonalities and the, the, the stuff that we could use as a base for reconciliation sort of fly away. Well, I mean, it's it, one thing that's true is that often conflicts within communities are often worse than conflicts between communities. Uh, your shul seems like a quite happy place. There are many shuls. I'm sure some of you have been members of them. 
that are not and that go through horrendous spasms of viciousness uh, club uh, and and there's one quote about university politics that university politics is so brutal because the stakes are so small and actually i think that gets it wrong actually i think it gets it wrong because most of us the places where we spend our time the most are in those small worlds right we don't spend our very few of us spend our time within america or within britain you, most of the people on this call, you, you spend your time in New Haven or in its environs, in your workplaces, in this synagogue, in the clubs or societies that you're members These days, are. mainly confined to a bedroom. Keith. Well, all right. Okay, <laughs> fine. <laughs> See, that what I just said would have worked much better nine months ago. But you know what I mean? Those are the places that you live. And that's why it's so brutal. It's, uh, it, it, it's, also, it's very difficult to conceptualize America. It's much more easy to conceptualize the Jewish people or American Jewry and, uh, and so on. There is that, and, and Michael will know this off by heart better than I do, which is, I think it's in PK of what, which is that you should struggle for peace first within your household, then within your neighbor, your town, and then within your city, and then within whatever it is. The, the, the point being that you start where you are. I don't think that's sufficient in and of itself, um, but certainly one of the things that, that one of the positive side effects where I'm from of the pandemic has been, I don't know whether this has happened in America, is the upsurge in mutual, local mutual aid societies. Uh, people help each other, people getting to know neighbors. If there has been, if I've seen anything hopeful in this very bleak year, it's been that, the sense that people can actually build community, you know, help each other with practical support without necessarily being, uh, you know, without, see my local support, my local mutual aid group, which I haven't been very involved in, but I helped set it up and then stop being so involved. I don't know what people's political views are. I suspect because of the name that I'm in, they're probably fairly liberal, but I don't know that. It doesn't necessarily matter because the group is, is based on some very, very, very basic stuff. Like in May and April, when everything was locked down, we were sharing, sharing sourdough recipes, right? Things like that. Or we were looking out for lost cats and things like that. That sort of pragmatic everyday stuff, I think works. And one of the, but, 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 Going back to America, one of the depressing things is that a lot of it, a lot of what's going on is a geographical divide. If you look where red, the divide between red states and blue states, uh, although it's not as simple as that because there are plenty of people in uh, in New York State who vote Republican and plenty of people in Oklahoma who vote who vote Democrat, but nonetheless, it, it, I, I do I am a strong believer in local in, in local bread and butter stuff. Uh, where you deliberately and where you don't and often su superficial relationships I think sometimes we overestimate the importance of deep encounters with people um, as being the gold standard that all relationships have to have to have to uh, ha have to meet but actually superficial cordial and helpful relationships I, I, I think are really important <laughs> So I, I've talked a bit, I, I've gone quite a long way from anti-Semitism, but I hope that's useful anyway. <laughs> Well, I, uh, I feel that this conversation can continue for uh, significantly longer, but uh, I'm, I'm also quite aware of the fact that it is now well past 11 at night uh, in London. And so I truly appreciate, uh, now I feel like uh, we need to go back and, and get another talk about the book about uh, conflict resolution and reconciliation. Uh, right? Well, actually, maybe, I maybe did. That would be, I, that would I was, if time I would have mentioned that, I used to, I did run conflict resolution groups within the, the British Jewish community. Hmm. I did do that, including Jewish leaders. And the way we did that is Deborah and I invited people to our house for dinner. 
Uh, well, it would these, work nowadays, would it? You, you can't. No, not really. No. <laughs> Although we can all have dinner uh, like this, I suppose, uh, as as we we certainly did for for Shoshana. We invited everybody to just share dinner with each other. So, um, with uh, while we'll, we we'll have to wait for the opportunity to actually get dinner with everyone. And while I am certainly uh, quite upset that we couldn't have Keith in person with the actual physical books uh, with him. Uh, come to tea and spend a weekend with us. I, I have a feeling that uh, I know that one of these days the current restrictions will end and next time you find yourself uh, stateside, we will absolutely make sure that you come back and we'll continue this conversation in person. And for now, thank you so much for being here with us. This thank you for inviting me. Fantastic. It's really nice to speak to an American and, audience. And um, the, there was a link to the book where you can get it online. Um, uh, I'm sure that if you if you write <laughs> Dr. Ken Harris, he'll send you a, a sticker with the with a signature uh, or, or whatever it may be. Uh, and um, and and of course, it's a it's a really timely and important um, opportunity for us uh, to in, to engage. Um, so, um, uh, friend, what, what are you, what are you saying? You want to continue the conversation, just stay for people and, and talk. Is that what you're saying? Uh, you know, hold on one second. Never mind. No, I was saying that he, that you, Keith, you've sparked a lot of really good talking points. There's no reason why in TE we could spend an afternoon, you know, for an hour sitting around and talking like we do with scholar and residents. We'll just create some afternoon sessions and people who want to get on and talk and discuss could do that. That's that sounds like a great uh, I think some of our uh, some of our co-chairs of the adult education committee are here. They're taking notes as I, as I And can. I'm wondering if Fran might be willing to facilitate. <laughs> and, that's, that and that's, Keith, how conflicts are resolved at Temple Emmanuel. You just assign. I'm willing to help this in any way I can. <laughs> uh, it's a bit like synagogues are a bit like, they're a bit like the army. The golden rule of the army is never volunteer for anything. That's the same rule in synagogues. Never you know, you know, in our place, uh, you you will rarely see anybody uh, volunteer for something because they want the glory of leadership or the big title. It mostly sent, tends to come from the realization of, well, nobody else seems to be stepping up to this, and uh, that kind of needs to happen. So I guess we we are full, like with prophets, we're full of reluctant leaders, all of whom uh, That's end the up best absolutely. Kind. It's Acula. the best kind. You don't want the enthusiast. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I think we outsource it to enthusiastic rabbi, right? One thing I know is that that synagogues throughout the world, they're not all the same, but they kind of are all the same. <laughs> That's true. And on that, um, thank you very much for inviting me. Shavuot have a Tov. Wonderful week. Thank you so much, Keith, for being here with us. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye.